This video will be an analysis of the Cartesian test who was sponsored to call your soups the burden of proof, although I'm not going to cover it in its entirety. This is a response to Qualia Soup's latest video called The Burden of Proof. I'm not going to comment on everything in the video, but I'm going to pick out a few segments and then demonstrate that Qualia Soup is horribly oversimplifying the subject he is talking about. Here's the first clip. Well, if God didn't create the universe, what did? Questions like this are examples of another common form of burden shifting. The underlying implication is that if the sceptic can't explain just how our universe came to be, then the idea that a god created it somehow wins by default. But that's not how it works. Answers involving supernatural beings don't get a free pass. They must be substantiated like any other candidate answer. And even if divine answers to this question were acceptable, monotheism would have to jostle with a potentially limitless variety of polytheisms. The very notion that a question as complex and involved as this has a default answer, other than I don't know, is misguided. Learning about our universe takes time and disciplined work, so demanding that everything has an explanation now is an untenable position, and inserting supernatural beings into the inevitable gaps in our current knowledge commits the fallacy of arguing from ignorance. The first problem here is that Qualia Soup appears to be suggesting that in the absence of an overwhelmingly strong theory, one can be justified in being completely sceptical. But this is not so. When it comes to the origin of the universe, there are various competing explanations, and one has a duty to think about which explanation is the most rational one. Both atheists and theists propose metaphysical explanations. The atheist might propose an uncaused beginning, or some multiverse paradigm, and the theist will likely propose agent causation. Now what is needed is to think about which probabilistic argument is metaphysically more sound. It's simply not good enough for the atheist to say, we don't know for sure. That's just being lazy. In both philosophy and science, there is a strong tradition of making an inference to the best explanation, and that is the duty of a reasonable person. Therefore, the sceptic on the right is not being intellectually virtuous at all. They are in fact playing the game of hyperbolic scepticism because it suits their hidden metaphysical commitments to do so. To sum up, the Cartesian theist thinks that it is an intellectual duty to give different metaphysical explanations even when overwhelming evidence is not present, and to try to understand which one appears to be the more compelling. To simply say, we don't know, is instead a demonstration of laziness and or overly scepticism to favor one's view. This idea of his is something I disagree with when we are dealing within the highly unfamiliar fields where divine explanations are employed. When we are engaging in metaphysics, what we are doing is basically stretching our reason and intuition to reach into the unknown, using the prior known as a frame of reference. Metaphysics are indispensable in our pursuit of knowledge, but how heavily we should rely on them ultimately depends on the context considered. An ordinary situation, like the incident at the Judo Dojo that the Cartesian theist later mentions in the video, is one where metaphysical predictions are very reliable. The doctor who is visiting the patient is dealing with an injury he has surely medicated before and been told about its cause, has read about and almost certainly suffered himself before in his life and other means of prior knowledge I am now leaving out. Let us now turn to a situation where the divine explanation is often mentioned, that of the origin of the universe. We are trying to understand a phenomenon we have never observed before. We are dealing with altogether new notions of causality. This context is well outside from the reality we have normal contact with, while the previous one was well within it. The use of metaphysics in this situation will not be the assumption of an event we already observed, but of new laws of physics. My point is that different situations require different evaluations on the reliability of metaphysics, and the amount of evidence necessary for engaging in them. Depending on the conclusion you reach, you may choose a more cautious approach, 
and wait for more evidence to turn up. History has indeed shown plenty of theories elaborated by people who projected their intuitions in long shots, trying to grasp what is in the cosmos, confidently relying on the knowledge they held in that moment, and then abruptly smashed their teeth against the counterintuitive evidence that turned up in a more or less large amount of time. When in such contest, if one considers the evidence available to be insufficient to assume on great lengths, I believe he has good reasons for doing so and no intellectual duty to do otherwise. That is a more honest attitude than proposing casting metaphysics you do not truly perceive as reliable, just to give a competing explanation to another one already moved by the counterpart, which instead seems to be what the Cartesian theist thinks you are obliged to do. The statement, I don't know, isn't a demonstration of laziness, but an acknowledgement of the futility of long-reaching speculations where evidence is lacking and high uncertainty lie ahead. The accusation of being overly sceptical, well, that is sparkling evidence of the gap that can open in people's perceptions when discussing these issues. What the Cartesian theist considers over scepticism is what I call reasonable cautiousness. About the charge of favoritism, everyone has his own subjective degree of scepticism. What the Cartesian theist seems to assert is that atheists are playing stubborn in order to favor their views. I could say they are just adopting the standard and degree of skepticism that has caused them to become atheists to begin with. It may be that some atheists believe that the theist counterparts are the ones acting gullible to favor their views. In the same regard, the Cartesian theist makes the following assumption. On the accusation of arguments from ignorance, I can only think that Qualia Soup must be suggesting that all questions about the origin of the universe are questions which the natural sciences will one day be able to answer. However, there is widespread scepticism whether that will ever be possible. Not knowing Qualia Soup, I can't assume whether he thinks that or not, but I don't understand why he would have to. Even if one was to concede that there are questions that the science can't answer, he could still dismiss metaphysical solutions. If he believes that natural science is the most efficient tool to find out about truth, how could he consider speculations to be somehow able to make up for science limits? Moving on. It would be oversimplifying to say that one explanation is called the how, and the other is called the why, because it's not quite that simple. But at least that way of wording it might begin to help us understand that when talking about an explanation of an event, the discussion is going to be broader than science. Keep this in mind as we go to Qualia Soup's next clip. Saying a god created our universe doesn't explain how it was created and poetic metaphors are no more illuminating. Saying a god speaks things into creation, for example, doesn't explain how divine speech results in creation. Gods and poetry get us no closer to the process we're actually interested in. They only push the question further back while the actual process remains unknown. And this is ultimately what so-called divine explanations give us. I don't know, hidden under a supernatural wrapping. Remove the wrapping and we get an honourable answer. Rejecting inadequate answers doesn't automatically oblige us to know the actual answer. Rejecting divine pseudo-explanations doesn't mean we have to know everything about the universe. I think most philosophically minded theists would completely agree that saying a god created our universe doesn't explain how it was created. Of course it does not explain the how but it might help to explain the why question, and it might help us explain the who question. If the process one is only interested in is the crude question of material causation, then perhaps Qualia Soup, like Richard Dawkins, might reply that questions of why and who are either meaningless or unworthy of exploration. But along with most philosophers, whether atheistic or theistic, I would suggest this is naive. After all, in ordinary life we almost always want answers to the why and who questions. 
As I write this, Sky News is reporting a double murder in the UK, which took place earlier today. How the two people died is known, but interestingly, the reporter almost entirely ignores this. What people are really interested in are the who and the why questions. And even if, in this case, science can help establish the who, which is exactly why I suggested earlier we are somewhat oversimplifying a complex issue, the why question is a perfectly legitimate and important one. And even if the answer to it is not complete and has areas of ambiguity and frustration, we still want some idea of the answer. So, the Cartesian theist claims that while listening to a report of a double murder, a person would normally not be as interested in the how question as much as the why and who questions. Once more, the Cartesian theist is using an example of ordinary life. Is it reasonable to ask why and who in regards to the murder event? Yes, because the same concept of murder as we conceive it requires them. Respectively, the murderer, the murdered and the motivation that led to this event. Are there reasons to believe that the same questions can be reasonably asked and required to be answered even in regards to the origin of the universe? Is there a reason to believe that the universe actually exists for a motivation? Now, if this question can be answered in a satisfying way, then asking why and who in regards to the origin of the universe would appear reasonable to more people than there are now. Fact is that to the eyes of atheists, very little in the universe appears to resemble any sort of intent or scheme. It appears instead morally neutral, chaotic, and devoid of purpose as far as purpose can be conceived. Once again, we are meeting an irreconcilable difference of perspective. The Cartesian theist thinks that it's naive to ignore the why and who questions. An atheist could believe that supposing there is a motivation for the cosmos, given what we know about it, is wishful thinking. Of course, a creator may not have values by us conceivable, but that will render whether the why question is reasonable, impossible to determine through observation of appearances of design. And even if we were to actually notice appearances of design by us conceivable, there would be a dilemma of whether we were just projecting our bias upon valueless natural phenomena. So, how to determine if there is a why to be asked in regard to the universe? I believe you must first presuppose a who. And so, it all comes down on whether agent causation appears necessary to you to explain currently unsolved mysteries about the universe. And this delves deeply into the how question. Therefore, answering a how is the first necessary step before moving to who and then why. If an atheist, like Dawkins, finds the explanation by agent causation a bad one, the why question inevitably becomes nonsensical. Well, that's all I wanted to say. I'm sure there are other points worth discussing, but these were the ones that interested me the most. Thank you for listening.